To defend the colonies against external threats, including pirates, but more often hostile native tribes, governors established local militias. Every able-bodied male was expected to serve in the militia, and every home was expected to have at least one working firearm. The militias drilled in tactics such as volley fire and quick response to emergency bells. They built solid defenses around each village and kept their powder dry. But in contrast to professional armies, the militias were loosely structured and generally only met a few days a year to drill. The militia were required to provide their own weapons. Often, these were fouling pieces. These were popular for their versatility, able to fire a single large ball or a handful of shot for hunting waterfowl. English colonies struggled in their relations with the native populations. Though these were friendly relations at times, there were also periods of conflict. During a conflict known as King Philip's War, New England colonists and their own Native American allies battled against a confederation of other native tribes. In that war, a colonialist named Benjamin Church emerged to form a company of colonialists and allied natives. Church learned the natives' tactics for moving through the forests and swamps undetected and fighting a more guerrilla style than was known to Europeans. These were the first American ranger forces, and Benjamin Church is considered the father of American ranging. These skills proved valuable, for the conflicts did not end when one of Church's native allies killed the so-called King Philip, a native chieftain. From the late 1600s, almost up to the American Revolution, there are a series of wars between English colonials and French colonials, each having their own allies among the Native American tribes. The most famous is the last one, known in America simply as the French and Indian War, ending in 1763. But there were others, with Europeans and Natives alike, wielding muskets in their struggle for control of the New World. Within the broad categories of matchlocks, wheel locks, and flintlocks, there was a wide variety of gun designs. Wheel lock dueling pistols. And, like any art, gunsmithing drew its artists. Guns made for nobility might include beautifully carved gold or silver designs. One well-known style of gun was the blunderbuss. This might be a shorter musket or a pistol, marked by the flared muzzle at the end of its short steel or brass barrel. The broad opening at the top made loading the powder and shot easier and faster, and the blunderbuss could be devastating at short range, usually firing a handful of lead shot. The blunderbuss is strongly associated with the pilgrims in American mines, though those early colonists made use of other firearms as well. The 75 caliber flintlock musket, known as the Brown Bess, was the standard for British soldiers through 18th and early 19th centuries. The Brown Bess musket is English in origin, and this is based on the muskets they developed in the early 18th century, roughly around 1722, and these muskets uh, are what won the English their empire around the world. These muskets are all roughly around 75 caliber, smooth bore muskets, and they use a flintlock as the system of ignition. And this particular example is a copy of the shortland pattern musket that was developed just prior to the American Revolution. Uh, this example has uh, the marked tower on the lock plate indicating that it had been inspected in the Tower of London. These things were battle winners in their time. 
they are smooth bore and inherently inaccurate. They're only accurate out to about 50 to 75 yards. Anything greater than that, the accuracy really drops off quite a bit. Uh, this thing is quite simply loaded. A uh, soldier would take a cartridge from his cartridge pouch, normally worn at the waist or from a broad sling on their right hip. They would draw a cartridge from their pouch, bring it to their mouth, tear it open, pour a little bit within the pan, shut the pan, pour the remainder of the gunpowder down the barrel. They would draw out this long iron ramrod and ram the whole cartridge down with a tamp and return the rammer to the pipes just underneath of the barrel. Then the soldier was ready to fire. A good soldier was supposed to be able to fire three shots in a minute. I know I've seen people that can get between four and five shots in a minute with one of these is uh, really quite a feat. The comparable gun among the French was the Charleville musket, a 69 caliber smooth bore musket. These muskets were standard issue for French infantry after 1717. Named for the armory in the Charleville Mezières, Ardennes, France, the Charleville, like the Brown Bests and other smooth bore muskets, was accurate to around 50 to 100 yards. The 1717 Charleville had a pinned barrel, like the Brown Bess, but the 1728 model would have three barrel bands instead. This was easier to disassemble and clean and was a stronger design for bayonet combat. The gun was about 60 inches long and about nine pounds. The Charleville and Brown Bess were sturdy, dependable flintlocks, perfect for their intended purpose. The goal was not individual accuracy. When the armies of Europe met on the field, they gathered into formation and fired volley after volley of heavy lead balls into the opposing forces. The soldiers could load and fire roughly three shots per minute. As the smoke from the black powder made it difficult to see, even within the limited range of their guns, they did not place a high value on marksmanship. Once their shot was spent, the soldiers would affix bayonets. With bayonets attached, the long guns were effective pikes for use against cavalry and could be deadly hand-to-hand -hand weapons as well. The Charleville and Brown Bess, like most firearms of that day, were smooth bore muskets. It had been known for some time that a rifled barrel could fire a bullet further and more accurately. A rifled barrel has a pattern of twisting grooves which gives the projectile a spin as it leaves the barrel. That spin gives the bullet stability. But rifled barrels were more prone to fouling by the black powder used during that period. Also, for a bullet to take advantage of the rifling, it would need to fit tightly into the barrel. This made loading more difficult. Smoothbore guns like the Brown Bess and Charleville could be reloaded more quickly and military tactics at the time did not require the range or accuracy afforded by rifles. But hunters could appreciate both of these characteristics. If you're eager to see more of our historical documentaries, please like, share, and subscribe.